The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get this webinar started. Um, first, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to um, register and, and be with us today uh, for what should be about an hour-long uh, webinar looking at remote distance and virtual simulation in light of COVID-19. And to kind of, you know, be discussing um, some practical and informative approaches with our panel of experts on how to uh, look at simulation and incorporate simulation as we, um, together with our students and our institutes, um, try to provide the best education that we can as we develop and mature future clinicians. I want to thank uh, NAEMSE and the Society for Simulation and Healthcare for teaming up in this collaborative podcast. Um, webinar, sorry, um, and that we hope that it is informative to our audience and that we are practical and grounded. Um, in just a moment, I will introduce our panel and myself, um, but before we um, get too far into it, I want to help ground our conversation and our focus today with some recent survey results um, of a survey conducted by NAEMSE on COVID-19 um, to our educators. The survey was sent out and about 418 uh, responded to the survey. And we asked broad questions about how COVID-19 has been impacting uh, the education and classroom and student experience. 64% said that they were able to teach classes and programs during COVID-19 shutdown. And so this leaves 36 that reported that they could not. And so I think today we hope to be able to provide some sort of input or guidance on what maybe we can do to help them, at least in terms of simulation. 78% did report that they were able to move to online teaching, with 70% of those doing lecture only online, and 29% reporting that they're able to do more than one, so a combination of lecture, lab, and or clinicals. However, one of the um, elephant challenges we're all experiencing right now is that 86% report that they're not doing clinical rotations. 57 did report that they were, and if any of those individuals or those sites are um, uh, here, um, maybe share how you're doing that, because I think that's a, a million dollar answer right now. 70% uh, anticipate a backlog or increased demand for EMS graduates as a result of COVID-19. That is something that NEMZ is aware of, as well as NREMT and other organizations, and we're all working together to try to address best practices and identify ways to address that backlog. We know that when we return to operations, as you share with, uh, with us, um, there's a question of what will all this look like with social distancing in place as we begin to return to operations? How will we manage and schedule for smaller groups? I think that's a great question for this panel today to begin to uh, tackle or address. How are online approaches here to stay and things are on hold until clinicals can resume? And so that's another great question that perhaps we could begin to look at is the role of simulation, knowing that clinicals are either um, cut short or going to be a challenge or going to be um, rushed. So as we transition, um, we recognize that a lot of unknowns remain. And we're EMS professionals, we're adapting. That's what we've been educated and experienced to do. And we're doing our best as educators to be adaptive. We know that there's gonna be challenges in our clinicals, preparing and adjusting for smaller group learning and how we pivot short-term and may even long-term to online and distance approaches, not only for our lectures, but for our simulation. Again, we hope to be able to provide some practical and informative uh, thoughts on that today and how this will influence the norm past or post COVID-19. So on our panel today is Mr. Andrew Spain. Andrew is the Director of Certificate for the Society of Simulation and Healthcare. He is currently working on his dissertation to complete his PhD in education at the University of Missouri and has been a paramedic since 1992. Joining as well as Dr. Patel, Amar Patel is the Chief Learning Officer at CAE Healthcare. Again, thank you for your support today as well. He has a vast history as a firefighter, paramedic, researcher, and educator. 
Dr. Patel has been involved in simulation-based education development and growth. He is active at both local and federal levels on a variety of quality and patient safety committees. Also joining us uh, from the Society for Health Simulation is uh, Tim Whitaker. He's a former armor, Army medic and has over 35 years in the pre-hospital and critical care transport arenas. He is an educator, author, and speaker. He's dual certified in simulation as a certified healthcare simulation educator and as an operations specialist. He's active with many societies and serves them in multiple capacities as he continues to serve as the group leader for the academy operations at CA, CAE Healthcare. Also joining us today is Dr. Kim McKenna, one that we all know and admire so much. Uh, Kim is the Director of Education for St. Charles County Ambulance District located in the St. Louis metro area. Along with providing the just-in-time education and QI needed during the pandemic for the district's 200 paramedics, Kim and her team are trying to make a quick pivot to maintain forward progress for the 50 students in their entry-level EMT and paramedic programs, where she is the program director. Kim, is, Kim was also the primary author for the super study on simulation and EMS education. I'm Dr. William Legio. I am currently serving on the board of directors for NAEMSE, and I will be moderating this webinar. I'm also the clinical operations practices and standards coordinator with the office of the medical director for Austin Travis County. I serve as the, I also serve on the technical expert panel for EMS Agenda 2050. Many of you were asked to submit questions when registering. Um, thank you for submitting such wonderful and robust questions. Uh, what we did was we, we looked at all those questions. We tried to find consistent questions or uh, some sort of themes so that we could front load the webinar with specific questions or uh, questions pre-assigned to our panelists. So first um, is uh, Andrew Spain. Um, Andrew, um, one question that really emerged quite quickly from all of this was, what simulations can we be doing easily uh, remotely to support any face-to-face -face time programs can regain in the future as operations may or may hopefully return sooner rather than later? And how can programs overcome logistical challenges of providing equipment to students or situations where the student does not have anyone at home to practice on? So for example, how do you take a blood pressure when you're, when you're living alone and trying to learn that hands-on skill? And there's no doubt that that particular individual that you provide as a an example, whether they're at home alone, uh, actually is going to be one of the most challenging individuals that you will have to somehow manage because the challenge that you all have at this time is getting any kind of face-to-face -face interaction and thus things like uh, you know practicing skills, practicing assessments, and so forth. But having said that, there are a lot of things that can be done, uh, and it really starts with sort of assessing what you have uh, in terms of your own situation for your program. Obviously there's things like the governmental regulations. What, what's even allowed in terms of any variance from our normal educational style? And so you'd have to start with understanding what your state is going to allow or not allow. And hopefully there's been a lot of those discussions going on in a state-by-state -state, uh, situation. Uh, if we have any of our international friends on the call, uh, you may be facing the same sorts of things. I don't actually know what they're allowing or not allowing in Canada or Mexico, for example, or of course overseas. But each state is in the US is going to have their own rules. And the reality is we don't have a lot of the information in place to even know what is already allowed in terms of simulation use in paramedic programs outside of the general guidelines from COAMSB, National Registry, and so forth uh, to help us say we should be doing it but now we're in at this remote slash distance slash virtual type of setting and trying to figure that out. So we have to start with understanding what the background is and to know what our individual program needs are, with the, whether you're EMTs, paramedics, uh, both. Uh, of course, you typically will have students at multiple stages and so how to keep them going along. When they're living by themselves, that's gonna be really difficult to get any kind of the uh, kinesthetic learning, such as taking a blood pressure, and you'd have to engage each individual student where they are to help to, to determine what you might be able to accomplish for that individual. And that's assuming that your needs assessment for your learners states they've got to still be able to demonstrate a blood pressure uh, and how to be able to do that. Uh, 
there's different things you can do in terms of the video conferencing to support uh, mental simulations. If you're not familiar with that term, that's essentially being able to work through things from a mental you know, cognitive approach. So there's a great deal that we can do with that, either facilitated or as individual take-home type activities, and they can report back out through a variety of means. You certainly can have a lot of group discussions, again, facilitated through things like video conferencing, be it through, uh, we obviously we're on GoToWebinar here, you've got Zoom. Uh, we've got our smartphones and tablets that do all these sorts of things. And so that can engage the conversations and the problem solving, developing things like the critical and clinical thinking. Uh, it takes a little bit of work to convert those in classroom things that you probably use to accomplish those. Uh, but it doesn't take a whole lot to be able to convert over to those uh, situations where you can keep that going and that will help them prepare for when things open back up and they can get that uh, in-person experiential piece either in the classroom or of course in the clinical setting if you're one of the lucky people who has a lot of extra equipment uh, has things like the vr ar or additional task trainers whatever it may be that can be loaned out uh, certainly a lot of variety of activities that can go on there. I know Amar is going to be discussing some of those in a little while. Kim has done some very interesting things with her students with send home equipment. So I'll defer to her to be able to share some of those things because I don't, I don't want to give away a little bit of her thunder. So I'll have her weigh in here in a second. Some of the hands on things that she has done. Uh, but remember that we've 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 come a long way in simulation. Many of you on the call probably started to learn started to, uh, your IV uh, skills through starting one on an orange. Uh, and so we, we have to think about the simple solutions, uh, the cost effective solutions, things that you can perhaps use with uh, items from home. Yes, they would have to get an IV catheter somehow and be able to practice and probably a number of them because you can't use that over and over and over and over again. But it's just a case of being creative, thinking about what technology you have available at hand, uh, keeping it simple, identifying what your learners need and then rolling from there. And so Kim, if you could perhaps weigh in on some of the things that I know you've done at SCAD, as that, that would give some tangible examples. Uh, sure, um, I um, I was gonna actually show some slides of them later on, but uh, so we- Leave it till then, if, if you wanna wait till that, that's fine, so. Yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, we've just been trying to figure out how to leverage the technology most effectively and, and uh, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll wait until I answer the other question later to, to share what specifically we've done so I can show you some pictures too. Great, great. And if anybody has used Zoom, uh, I don't know what the functionalities of GoToWebinar are is because I haven't used it recently, but Zoom has the option for things like breakout rooms. And that actually can create a great deal of flexibility in terms of that discussion type concept navigating people through a problem-based learning type of perspective, simulating cases, walking them into the, uh, once you've done this part of the assessment, what would you then do? Uh, you found this and back and forth. And so a lot of flexibility with that. Uh, I'm going to go back to you, Bill, and see if you want to uh, keep moving or get any clarifications ask uh, uh, from the other panelists. No, I think that really sets up uh, the next question of Tim uh, really well. And to our attendees, um, if you have questions along the way or things you want to ask, um, please submit those through uh, the webinar system. Um, at the end, we are going to dedicate time um, to, to answer your questions um, today as, as they may. Maybe you came with a question or something sparks interest and you want to know more about that. Um, so, so next question to Tim. Tim, what distance-based simulation practices or approaches support um, knowledge translation from virtual um, to, to clinical settings. And I think um, to kind of add a little bit to that and to kind of connect to what Andrew was saying, you know, using distance platforms and web based, I mean, how do we begin to integrate, you know, standardized patients or, or um, you know, an OSCE approach to simulation and start kind of building some bridges, but also doing things that's um, meaningful and practical to uh, web based platforms? Sure, happy to talk on that, Bill. Uh, thanks. Um, Andrew did bring up a couple of great uh, components. The OSCE format is, uh, we've actually been doing a lot of work with this kind of format to quickly pivot, uh, you know, medical schools uh, the, uh, over to uh, this virtual uh, the OSCE system. And it, there's a lot of value in this for EMS. You know, I refer back to some of the studies and the, the, the patient safety goals, 
Um, you know, where uh, some of those uh, interviews, uh, you know, these are uh, gaps that we see, as well as patient handoffs. And with the, the uh, uh, advent and the sudden uh, push for telemedicine, this all starts to coalesce itself together. So there's so many easy things to do with this, with the, with the SP format. So standardized patient, you know, that's going to be your patient. We want one of the, the um, students to interview that patient, make differential diagnosis, go through their, you know, OPQRST, things like that. And then provider, you know, maybe a, a, a cognitive level of how they would approach it for care. Uh, and it just really does help function and develop uh, up uh, critical thinking skills. You know, and even in this format now, it's still there's value uh, to that decision making process. There's value that they're going to take when we when we get back to whatever this new norm is uh, out into clinical settings. So some of the simplest things you can do is using the Zoom play. I mean, we even have our, our cell phones and uh, not to. Uh, push on Apple, but, you know, FaceTime now is, is able to do multiple FaceTime calls. Uh, the Zoom platform is, uh, is another great one. I mean, there's so many different just, just easy uh, technologies you can grasp onto, right? Um, and uh, you as the educator can be that SP. You could be the patient, um, and you can structure this all out um, and have a case study built, ready to go, and then work with your students. You could also, with some of the technologies, I have cohort students, and as Andrew had mentioned, go into the breakout room areas, um, and where they are working with maybe another student that was assigned to be an SP or that patient, and go through the critical thought processes of the interview, and then what my diffs are, and where I'm going to go with this patient as far as care, and then round back in for the debriefing part. Remember, but debriefing and simulations is where the that's the most important key element of your simulation uh, to. Uh, uh, to embed that learning and, and ensure that the learning's going on. So those are some of the some of the techniques we're being seen. There's also some unique things going on where programs, um, and I've spoken to, are reaching out and they're actually um, kind of uh, volunteering or soliciting family members and friends, and they're either uh, having a meeting with them or shipping them by you know email format, whatever, an SP packet. Basically, it's their script. And they're using family members to interact, and then the technology that you can sit there and evaluate your student. You know, even if they got a stethoscope at home, you know, during the interview and the SP uh, uh, evaluation, they're listening for lung sounds. You know, and you know they're going to be hearing. Things. There are there are some little bit of training scar pieces to it that we have to say, hey, this is what the sounds. That's what you're really hearing. There's still some value there with all that. Um, so there's a lot of different. Uh, uh, ways to uh, to integrate you know other uh, uh, elements into this uh, for them to do that and telemedicine too if you get your medical director on the line and we can just say this is uh, a patient handoff as, as well you can get them on the line with you and then it can do a report out to them uh, to type, uh, to embed some of that communication uh, process uh, you know it's, it's just getting those multiple actors around the technologies there any of you that do have any sort of simulation now um, Almost all manufacturers make some sort of standalone softwares for your simulation. Those have a whole lot of value too. I could actually show those in a background or on a separate screen, or uh, and basically this is your patient's vitals. There's your 12 lead pullback, and then we can walk through a treatment regimen with them. The whiteboarding that you could use, or even a simple camera and stick the whiteboard behind you. We've drawn patients on it, low cost solution. Draw a patient on it, and here's some tools that we're going to treat the patient with. What would you do? Where would I do that? I'd start a line and go so it, i mean it doesn't need a lot of expensive technology we're, we're walking around we're talking on it right now it's been some great we've been doing oscis with phones we've been we've been doing them uh left and right with phones so you know leverage what you have to make that learning i know we're in a little bit of a crux because there is a visceral part of our education and i get that um but we can still embed a lot of learning um uh, and again uh state by state how they're going to rule on all this uh, i can't speak on that nor do i want to that's a whole other conversation but some of this can actually be a, a pretty decent substitution you can actually even grab your low-hanging fruit what gaps have you seen in your clinical rotations let's focus on some of them in an oski format so and then again leveraging any software you have or you know even if it's just printed material you can easily bring those things up and save them as a pdf and then and pop them up on your whiteboard. So there is, the sky's kind of the limit on this, is this creativity, creativity. There's a lot of other valued things out there too, Bill, that I, I've been seeing that a lot of other companies uh, around and, and, and uh, campuses and um, academic institutions are opening up some of their virtual patients um, 
and they're also opening up a lot of different uh, tools uh, for assessment, things like that. So SSH's website is trying to keep a good list of these going. I know we got a great list actually, um, but we keep seeing more and more, even from uh, overseas and internationally where uh, these virtual patients are popping up. Uh, these are normally uh, things that they're just opening up because of the crisis. So grab that value right now um, and then uh, look for those and you can assign some of that work to your patients. You know, in a, in a sense to me, uh, this OSCE thing, the flipping of the classroom, this is where we're going to learn it, right? Uh, where I could uh, uh, give them a case walk and we can go through a case and then have them walk through and we discuss, right? So uh, a lot of value out there. Um, and again, just leverage what you have. The sky's the limit. Yeah, I think you bring up some really great points about how we don't have to be in this alone. Um, we all have resources in our community and advisory boards. And um, certainly, you know, this may actually be a nice opportunity to get our medical directors involved as, as you described. And um, thank you for the reminder about the importance of debriefing. And I certainly think um, uh, LMSs, you know, serve some really good functionality for that as well, you know, post discussion boards and those sorts of things. And, you know, I think that all uh, leads well into the next question um, to Dr. McKenna, which is pretty heavy on, you know, pedagogy and, and Bloom's taxonomy. I was really um, taken back by this question. It, it really speaks so well to how deep our educator community is thinking about um, the, the, these COVID times. And so, um, Kim, I'm going to ask the question that I will um, share the screen um, so you can share your slides with the, with the group. The question is, how do we begin to adapt different levels of Bloom's taxonomy or various ed education pedagogies for cognitive, psychomotor, and affective domains in distance-based simulation? Yeah, so I got the tough question. I don't think that's fair. <laughs> I, I, I feel the same way. <laughs> we, really? we all paid Bill to put it on you. Oh, I was going to say, darn it. Gosh, darn. Okay, well, let's see. I'm going to try and show my screen, hopefully show the right screen here. All uh, right. Um, so it says I'm sharing. Um, can you see my screen yep. right now? We see you. So you should be seeing uh, the New Blooms taxonomy. Is that correct? Yep. Okay, fantastic. So I, I thought for those of you that don't have a screen and, and are listening, I, I did, I'm not gonna go a lot into this, but just sort of as a reminder, the levels of the cognitive uh, Bloom's taxonomy, remember, understand, apply, analyze, oh, I have analyzed twice, <laughs> evaluate and create um, are the levels in the new Bloom's taxonomy. And I think those of you that have been educating for a long time know that a lot of those things get achieved not only with lecture, but get achieved in the lab setting. And so when we lost our lab settings, we lost a lot of that. But I think Tim's um, discussion just a few minutes ago really could help you uh, understand how using an OSCE could really have your students be able to use a lot of those, you know, develop a lot of those levels in the cognitive domain because when they're um, when they're doing the OSCE, they really have to be able to recall the facts, and they may have to, you know, they have to draw connections between ideas, and then even at the highest levels, justifying their stand or their decision. Um, so this next slide just shows a way that we did lab, which is not a um, psychomotor. Um, thing necessarily, but we integrated a lot of our um, like EKG uh, reviews and um, uh, modality reviews into the lab setting because those are areas that students really struggle with all through the year. And so when you're looking at the Bloom's Cognitive Taxonomy, you could see that really they have to remember the facts about the EKG interpretation. They have to be able to explain why they think it's a rhythm. They have to be able to use the information in new situations. You know, when we give them this rhythm and then we give them a patient that's pulseless, then they have to be able to think about it in the context of something different. So I think there's tons of things that you can do um, with pretty simple things. One of the things that we learned really early because we don't, we teach um, some online anyway to our providers and to all the firefighters in our county. And one of the limitations that we have with a huge group is obviously having that interaction. And so 
quickly, we decided we had to divide our students up into groups, um, particularly in the paramedic program, so that we could get more engagement and be able to achieve some of those higher levels of learning as we went through this um, process. And then you can use other non-simulation things like concept maps then to get them to analyze, evaluate, and create. And everything that you do does not have to be live in the classroom. You know, that's sort of part of that flipped classroom where you can have them do things at home and bring them back so that you can uh, evaluate those things later. And so then when we get into the things that we're struggling with the most, um, and I find this uh, particularly at our in our EMT class is how to teach uh, psychomotor skill from a distance. And I think that uh, Andrew already sort of addressed a few things like having them check blood pressures on family members and friends. And I think we certainly can't get to the higher levels of blooms, you know, with those five levels for those who don't have a screen being imitation as the lowest level, then where they're imitating, you know, copying what you've done, manipulation, where they're practicing the skill, then precision, where they can do that skill without looking at their skill sheet, articulation, where they can do that skill that you're trying to have them learn while they're doing something else, and then, of course, naturalization, where they can do the skill without thinking. So with our EMT students, we were really challenged to say, oh my gosh, what are we going to do for them? Because we were just entering the trauma module and we're like, dang, you know, a lot of these things are so hands-on. Um, and so we quickly learned that uh, we, our platform that we use is Zoom. So we set the instructor up um, for the Zoom presentation and then set up a separate, a separate um, Zoom camera so the instructor could do live demonstration. We also used some videos so the students could see the skill and our state is requiring that students still come in to our facility for testing for major exams. So when they came in for an exam, which we did very safely, we brought them in in very small groups, we screened everybody, everybody was masked, brought them in, tested them, and then we sent them home with a, a couple, a cravat and a roll of Curlex. And uh, we also had old CPR mannequins that had been retired and um, sent them home with those as well. So one of their assignments with that was to go ahead and apply a splint. And so they were given several splint assignments, and then they had to send a, a photograph of that to the instructor. And actually tonight then, the instructor is gonna show some of these and then talk to them about, okay, what do you think about Joe's? How does his look? What's good about it? What would you change about his, you know? and uh, I wish I could send you some of the other ones because either these are actually just two of the students and we have photo releases for the students, but some of the other ones are super cute because they have like their moms or their dads and and you can tell that their families are just so excited to be part of their learning. And so I think that that sort of addresses some other needs that our students have right now. Yeah. You know, one of the things that's driving me crazy is um, I'm a planner and learning is a planned experience. And so we're having to plan quickly and adapt and learn as we go along um, with the with these students. So a couple of other things that we learned how to do, and um, I don't have any stake in this vendor name, but we use a product called iSimulate. And very quickly, Andy, our um, lead instructor for the paramedic program, figured out how to uh, be able to screencast that so that when we were doing the step, you know, stepping through pediatric resuscitation, he could have the monitor up on the screen as well as the rhythm and the students could step him through. OK, now you need to turn on the sync button or now you need to dial it up to this. Oh, no, no, you didn't dial it up. And and so you can't exactly simulate the motor piece of it. But there are so many cognitive steps to being able to that those mental rehearsal steps to being able to get the sequence of a motor skill correct that you, we could do some of, of those as well. And so uh, one of the other things that we're gonna be doing is uh, we sent them home with their CPR uh, mannequins. And of course, one of the students and couldn't resist the opportunity to dress it up as a as a, a one of our EMT students, but uh, we're gonna have them just use a cereal box or a shoe box with the mannequins that we sent home and then go through the National Registry steps for the BLS station. 
time themselves if, if, or have a family member time themselves, time them um, so that they can be practicing that skill so that when we do bring them back in for labs, which we are actually planning to do in a couple of weeks in, a, again, a very small group setting, social distancing, masking, screening, all of those things, then they'll have the mental set and they should just be able to hopefully move into practicing those skills and, and um, doing those skills with um, minimal time. So those are sort of some of the things that, that um, we've been doing here. I know that um, some, uh, another instructor I know is using virtual simulations. In their state, they're allowed to substitute those for some EMT clinical experience. Uh, we're just sort of trying to figure this out, and I've already gotten two great ideas from my fellow panelists, so I'm very excited about the opportunity for that today. So, Kim, uh, are you able to go back to your mind map um, slide? We're actually getting quite a few questions about this. I think this this tool in particular um, has resonated well with, with our attendees. I've always used this tool whenever I had a student that really wasn't making connections with the topic very well because mm -hmm. you can very quickly see the potential misconnections um, so one of the questions is um, what what software did you use to create this or how do you have your students create their mind maps um, I use IHMC CMAP I could do I could do a webinar on that someday because that's a whole hour topic but we use a program it's a free program called IHMC CMAP Okay, and Andrew uh, sent a message. He uses XMind, which the basic one is is free, um, and there are pay for options as well. Um, I personally just had my students walk on a blank blank piece of paper. So uh, maybe if time permitting, towards the end, we can get back to um, those two software platforms as sure. well. Sure. Bill. Uh, so I we have Tim, one more. Uh, yep. Go ahead. Sorry, Bill. Uh, real quick, there's one. There's another one I would uh, think is favorable to mention. Prezi, P R E Z I. That's a free one, and they can, you can get some pretty good maps out of that. Prezi. Yes, sir. Yeah. Don't forget. It's actually, your a presentation tool. Don't forget your scopolamine patch. That makes me so nauseated. <laughs> <laughs> Watch. <it. laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I can't leave that one on very long. <laughs> um, we have one more question, and then we'll kind of transition to interjecting some of our um, attendees questions and maybe some broad questions that have kind of been brought up. Um, our, our last question is to Dr. Mar Patel. Um, I know this is your wheelhouse and this is kind of a fun topic because you know you kind of get to be big picture and play with technology and cool toys. Um, what can be done remotely to replace hands-on lab and scenario work? Um, can you discuss options as VR, simulated monitors, and et cetera, that can be easily adopted into um, EMS education? And then we're getting some questions about um, what about ALS skills? I mean, we've talked a lot about patient assessments and those sorts of things, uh, about like endotracheal tubes, um, needle decompressions, if there's any tools or VR out there that could help facilitate uh, maybe that realm of, of simulation skill development. Yeah, I think it's a it's a, certainly a hot topic, and uh, I love talking about big picture sky as it relates to you know virtual augmented artificial intelligence and all the things around technology that do um, certainly play a pivotal role. And, and to go back to highlight some of the um, some of the items that were discussed before, right? So everything from uh, case study designs to you know Kim mentioned the home splints and and the photos, those are still key pivotal things for for at home. You know, I, I think about um, my kids were in school and you know were were obligated and tasked to essentially uh, interact with them and and take pictures of, of of the things that they're doing and share it with their teachers right that is very much an element of how to do home home type things that still offer the same type of, of impact and effect that um, that students need to be effective in this role, right? And if we think about even the mind map that uh, that was just brought up and we were just talking about, I mean, something as simple as a whiteboard application within a within the Zoom or the WebEx or the GoToMeeting or the whatever the digital distribution platform that you're using, 
um, the whiteboards can play a pivotal role in helping people understand, right? There's something about the characters that, uh, that you can draw in an interactive PowerPoint or an interactive screen that guide you through the process. So there's multiple ways of learning. And I think it's important for folks to realize that not every individual learner learns the same way. And for years, we've adapted education to be very business centric or academic centric and oftentimes don't necessarily cater to the individual learner. This uh, realm of digitization that we're all pushed into, right? Uh, who would have thought a pandemic would have forced us into the digital world? But you know, this world of digital has really helped us re relearn how to learn. It's really helped us really shape the world of technology and education. Uh, so, you know, when we think about big skies, the limits, so we, we talked about assessment and different things at a simple level, but there are certainly complex elements that can be done. And so it kind of levels out a little bit, you know, virtual reality has been out. It's been out for a number of different years. If you want to date yourself a little bit, I'll date mine. You know, we think about uh, the world of avatars and, and Second Life and all these other games that are out there that bring in some level of, of virtual reality. We think about augmented reality and the mix of augmented and it starts to become that hybrid where we're actually mixing in um, holograms into the mix, right? Where you're not necessarily touching something, but you're certainly mixing in holograms so you actually have this, a clear spatial understanding. And then when we add um, holograms into something more tangible, we get into this world of mixed reality. And the, the first thing people think of is it's super expensive. I can't do this at home. There's no way for me to do it. Well, I think most of the population these days owns a smartphone. Um, the applications that are available online are super cheap. You can actually make your own um, augmented and virtual worlds um, using simple three to five dollar applications that are out there that allow you to record your environment. And then, you know, if you're if you're a little bit savvy on it, import it in your computer. And there are free apps that allow you to be able to put holograms inside of it. So you can actually create your 2D environment all with your phone and in about 45 minutes of work, right? So certainly there's a number of both free and, and super cheap uh, things that are out there that lets you create that augmented feel. Um, obviously the headsets and stuff do get expensive, but oftentimes what I encourage folks to do is go to Amazon, right? Uh, they, have a, a, they have a $10 cardboard headset that lets uh, students be able to create that same level of virtual reality using their same mobile device. And you can push the application to the student's phone to create that same environment. So there are some really neat things associated with it you can do some uh, do pretty well that allow students to actually see what you're seeing, learn from what you're doing, and then later uh, have an example to apply to that. And again, in both a 2D or in a 3D environment. As we get into more complex things like case studies, um, you know, uh, if you uh, on the uh, Kim talked about what she was doing with regards to ECG and helping students go through that, take that same environment. And if you've leveraged any level of simulation technology coming from where we are at CAE, if you're leveraging Meister standalone as it is by itself, it's free, you can download it off the website. The unique thing is that it gives you all of your waveforms, ECGs, and everything else. And this is something that we uh, that I've been doing even, even before coming to CAE is teaching my students using a case study environment where you're making case scenarios really come to life, right? Program the scenarios, work through it, share your screens using a mobile platform. Again, go to meeting, WebEx, Zoom, whatever your, your distribution platform of choice is. Um, allow your students to be able to see the EKG. Allow your students to be able to see the changes that are happening in real time and progress through the scenario. If you're, if you're that higher level learner where you're teaching them how to do 12 leads, allow them to see the live 12 lead in time or broadcast the image, right? Broadcast a glucometer or broadcast the ultrasound image if you're covering ultrasound concepts. Um, it allows them to diagnose. And then the key to this is you're interacting with the learner to the point where you're asking them, well, why do you see that? Where do you see that change occurring? How do you work through that? If you're going through med administration or intubation, again, working through those individual competency-based skills and asking them to walk you through each individual step. So you're testing muscle memory and application. You're not actually physically able to see them do the skills. And setting up that environment in an at-home situation does, you know, the challenges with driving some of those skill sets in that, that singular environment is without the right direction, they're gonna learn ba bad muscle memory, right? And bad muscle memory equals bad skills. So it's important to really highlight how to do that well. And as long as they're able to really think through it, talk through it, 
And then you can easily set up some type of a chat session. That you're able to see them work through things like an orange or stitch a tomato or, you know, do all those advanced skills in a unique environment. There's so many opportunities in that digital, digital spatial area. There was a great study that, uh, you know, that actually came out uh, in 2007. And so, you know, now we're going back uh, almost uh, uh, 14 years. And the study really did focus on cognition and metacognition and where learning actually occurs throughout the, throughout the area. And, you know, one of the things that it, it highlighted was the need for higher order skills and interactive multimodal learning. Um, so being able to take digital technology, you know, and I think this is where we're all in the technology front and the industry side of the world being pushed a little bit is to say, how do I interact this digital into something that records learning and learning environments? And what the study had found from 2007 was that higher order of skills increases students' ability and cognition long-term, but it doesn't take a full simulation environment to do that. It takes high technology, a computer, a 2D spatial area, your phone, or other things where students are actively interacting and engaging and being pushed to answer those right questions at the right time in the right situation. So creating those learners, six students, five students, four students, whatever your number of students are in the same area, assigning them a role, tasking them to accomplish something and helping you walk through it and work together to accomplish that is where you're really pushing the memory side of it. So, you know, as we think about virtual and augmented, I'm a big fan of like uh, Legoland and Disney, um, you know, a great example to where, you know, you can do some pretty cool stuff even at home with Oculus is, uh, is if you ever end up uh, post, uh, post COVID, heading over to Legoland, they have one of these rides where you're wearing the virtual glasses, right? And every time you ride the ride, it's a different ride every time. Uh, and it's the same roller coaster. That roller coaster doesn't change, but the ride certainly evolves every time. Um, that's what we want to create for our students. And how do we do that? You can simply do that using something as simple as an iPad or an iPhone um, or free software applications that are out, right? I mean, for us, uh, you know, we've uh, we've been really pushing the envelope in terms of just st standalone physiology-based software and, and sharing screens and working through case studies. And that digitization really does help push, push some of the efforts. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll stop because I can keep rambling on digitization all day long, and uh, I guess we'll open up for, for to, back to you. Yeah, so we're getting a lot of questions about this. Um, Amar, can you um, put together or share, you know, either now or after the pop, after this webinar, um, a list of some of those free or cheap apps that you discussed? I'm sure that um, nemzi has been putting together a hub of resources, you know, um, if you can share some now and then uh, perhaps send us a list afterwards sure. so we can get that disseminated to our uh, membership and to the to the profession yep absolutely yeah bill if i could uh, add on tech on them amar a lot of uh cae obviously i can speak on them but a lot of your simulation companies have the standalone the simulators that there's their software that operates those simulators um, and trial versions. There's 90-day trial versions floating around. And downloading those and using those to leverage exactly what Amar said, it, it doesn't cost anything, and you just put it on a platform. I mean, there's even some had, uh, institutions have had students get the software and actually build a patient on the software. They had them full with the software, get used to it, and build them. Give me a patient. Give me a patient with COPD. Um, and you can run through all these, uh, these software platforms. And even during the debriefing process, they uh, save their events in the background. So you can pull it up and say, okay, you told me to uh, bag him at uh, 10 respirators per minute on this. And I can actually, you can actually pull the data out of the background and say, well, look for his stats and everything we're at. But when you went up to 15, the CO2 decreased. So there's a lot of, a lot of value in these, uh, what Amara mentioned. And, and again, free. And yeah, I mean, a, sorry, go ahead. That's a great approach um, when you think about maybe how we do some summative simulation assessments right now and this you know kind of goes back to um, the information shared by uh, Kim is you know uh, what better way to really assess summative knowledge than having students create their own scenarios and running them with their colleagues or peers um, you know just kind of creatively thinking outside of the box um, sorry Dr. Patel for cutting you off do you please go ahead 
No, no, I, and I think you're bringing up a great point, right? So it, it allows you to do two things in digitization world, right? You're really allowed to allow your students to have both formative and summative learning occur, right? A formative, uh, sorry, formative learning and summative testing being a portion of that. It, it, and we can go down the spatial track of, you know, what if we integrate uh, HoloLens into the mix? And I'm a big fan of the research side of it, where if we add HoloLens technology, or if you add anything that's doing technology and you give that to the learner in the home environment now you're actually taking holographic imagery that doesn't necessarily need mixed reality but now I'm actually paying attention to what they're seeing in a screen in a hologram and testing how the brain is processing information in real time right and what they're seeing and what they're looking at so imagine that whole world um, certainly for 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 testing great and uh, again to the attendees um, uh, Nemzi will work with Dr. Patel to follow up on this and at least distribute um, some list of, you know, some of the free or cheap apps that um, he, he is talking about. And um, uh, if you have a couple of those studies, the citations as well, we can certainly forward those on as well. Um, so I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank you for um, taking the time to answer um, those uh, really robust questions that were submitted by our uh, attendees as they registered. And um, I, I think we really captured and kept um, attendance. I mean, our attendees have actually increased since starting and, and stayed consistent. So I think we're we're hitting on some uh, good information that's uh, desired and, and um, sought after. Um, I do kind of want to go back to one question um, and kind of frame it a little bit differently and keeping in mind with the survey results. Um, you know, what can we be doing now knowing that we can't, uh, be together physically, um, but knowing that eventually and hopefully soon we may be able to engage um, in small group learning. And so kind of keeping that in mind, any thoughts on how we begin to facilitate, scaffold, sequence, whatever word you want to use, um, simulation now, knowing that eventually we're going to be hands-on together soon, maybe in a more condensed timeline. This is, can I answer that? This is Kim. Yeah, no, that's a, to any of the panelists, please. Yeah, let me just say, I think the first thing is that you have to convince the students that everything that you're doing online is not less than, but different than what they're accustomed to. Because I think in the beginning, they don't really value it. And so if you can really convince them that all of these uh, simulation activities and other activities that you're doing online or sending them home with are really setting the table for when they can go back on the road or when they can come back into the lab so that their time can be used most effectively there. And that it's also building that sort of cognitive framework, not only for, <clears throat> for lab and for clinical learning, but for when they actually go out on the road. So I think for me, that's that's one of the most important things in the beginning, especially it was convincing them that this really has value. I would ag agree with that because even if you're having them do something like a tape outline on the floor of a human body, it's not like you're assessing a real person, but the huge value in that, especially when you think about the challenges that learners often have with just the trauma assessment through the National Registry, they still can get the sequencing of the skills and, and be able to easily apply that when they actually have a real patient or in a real testing situation because they'll have all the steps already down and know exactly what needs to be done. And all that can be video reported back to the, the <laughs> instructors. And uh, yeah, just again, it, it it's filling in all those gaps and filling in the time and keeping them up to speed. And when they're back, then you can focus on the other things. Kim, any advice on how you develop that trust um, with the students and that belief and that buy-in? Well, ironically, the um, last month, uh, the well, we're not in May yet. Yes, last month in March, uh, the PCRF, Megan Corey, selected an article that looked at outcomes from distance education as compared to face-to-face -face training. Now. It, it was different. It didn't specifically speak to simulation or anything. And it showed that, that the outcomes were not inferior to and at least equal to, and in some cases higher than, it was a meta-analysis, um, higher than um, 
what students were getting face to face. So I think, you know, so the bottom line is that, the, and the challenge that we really face is engagement. And so that's one of the things as we go forward, transitioning <clears throat> activities into the classroom and figuring out how to do them online and figuring out how can we have the students doing things and engaging things. And I think that, that um, Amar had some great ideas and Tim had some great ideas where we're actually having scenarios and like really, really having them involved in the learning. That's going to be the challenge going forward. Excellent. And uh, for those that may not be aware, um, those PCRF podcasts, those research podcasts are available through PCRF. So um, perhaps that recent one is, is a good one to go tap into and and take a listen. Um, PCRF does great work with research and uh, we're a proud partner. Uh, NEMS is a proud partner with them and uh, great, good job uh, and for providing that information. Um, you know, another challenge based on the survey and from our anecdotal conversation with colleagues, um, thoughts on simulation and, you know, clinical access. I mean, it seems like clinical access is going to be um, an ongoing challenge for programs. So, you know, the EMT level and the paramedic level, um, how can simulation begin um, to, to, you know, build into clinical time when we finally get back to it or to um, augment or supplement it? Or is that even possible? Hey Bill, I'd like to speak and probably Andrew probably could tag on the back end with me. Uh, I think we need to embrace what the uh, National Board, the, the nursing, the uh, that longitudinal study they did. Um, we need this nationally, uh, and it, this might be a little soapboxing, but we need a national buy-in that uh, says it is is okay uh, to use X amount of simulation in lieu of actual clinical rotations. We've seen the value of this already. Uh, the, the multiple states have adopted that. Uh, the state boards of nursing. Um, I think EMS needs to follow suit here because we are going to see challenges. We'll continue to see challenges and going forward. Um, and, and it's great to leverage that. A lot of institutions, uh, yours included, uh, if there's gaps in the clinical end of it, that's where they'll use that that substitution, right? So um, I think that's where it, that's that's the, the the starting point is that we need to embrace that and uh, uh, say it is a good substitution for X. Definitely agree with that. Uh, and adding on to what uh, Tim has, has stated, the, the NCSBN obviously did that study and showed that upwards of 50% uh, substitution actually had uh, equal, if not slightly improved outcomes, depending on which uh, piece of the puzzle you were looking at. Uh, and, and I know I've talked to a number of people in EMS and say, well, it doesn't quite fit for us in EMS or, or, or some of those things like that. But we also know that in some situations, we have no choice, uh, especially when you look at things like airway management. Uh, many of you on the call likely have extremely limited access to send your students into operating rooms because as uh, over years, uh, they, they've really restricted the access to that. So we've had to incorporate a lot more simulation and getting our, our paramedic students ready to place airways in, in those crazy settings that we have in the field. We know this, uh, and a lot of people aren't able to get the access that we had previously when we were you know, 10, 15, 20 uh, uh, years ago. And so being proactive and trying to address this so we aren't stuck in the situation again in the future, because we know we're gonna have changes and uh, challenges of access, if nothing else. It doesn't have to, we don't have to wait for a pandemic. And there's a lot of research out there that continues to grow that supports the, the use of high quality simulation uh, as a, a supplement um, and outright replacement in some cases. And we'll be continuing to research that and ensure that these things uh, function correctly in the future. I don't think we'll ever get to where we are in Australia with getting your pilot license without stepping in a plane. Uh, obviously, that's a much, uh, it, just a private pilot license uh, isn't perhaps as complex as taking care of patients. I don't think anybody would make that argument, but um, certainly there are options uh, looking as we go forward. Thanks. You know, Tim, and I, I appreciate you bringing up that, that nursing study. I had, um, it was in the back of my mind for many years, but anyway, um, 
we are at the point right now where our hospitals look like they may not let us come back in uh, in the near future. And also at the same time, the COVID policies that we have say that if you have to intubate a patient, it's got to be the most experienced person that does that intubation. So we, I, I know we're going to have to find an alternative for intubation. I just don't think we're going to be able to achieve it before this cohort is done. And, and uh, that's somewhere where we've never had to go before, but I mean, it's a reality. You know, our volume is down and the skills may not be there that the students have had before. So we're going to really have to look to simulation to fill some of those gaps. If you look oh, no, at history, I absolutely oh, sorry, go ahead, Amar. Sorry, I was going to say if you look at history as it is, right? If, if, do you guys all remember? Uh, and this is uh, again dating ourselves. I think all as a collective. Do you remember the original versions of how people got how le how people learned to be intubated? Right? It was live people, right? If you recall, they were sedating individual healthy people practicing bag valve vas ventilations and innovations over the years, right? And then eventually it moved into this world of mannequin-based technology. Uh, you know, we'll never obviously get there again, and my hope is we never do. Um, but certainly it begs us the question, how do we create this uh, tangible skill, uh, such an important element of a skill, and even keeping it up to speed in a at-home environment? Um, and, you know, is it a, is it a, and do we send every student home with an airway head? And does the airway head need to have some level of sensors or technologies? Like, a, you know, we think about, um, uh, the the Actronix CPR measurement tool, right? And Actronix had that bag valve mass sensor, it still does, right? That measures how well you're doing CPR and compressions. And I mean, do we feel like uh, as a group, uh, that's where we eventually need to go because of this, uh, because of the pandemic or because of the shift of where it's gonna be less classroom and more digital or more remote type of education. Um, the, the clinical piece is, is a challenge, right, as a whole. I mean, we want our students to be safe and comfortable, but at the same time, if they're not in a live clinical setting, certainly that is that becomes a, a robust challenge. And this is where I think creating your own simulation atmosphere and environment is gonna drive that forward. I mean, you're seeing more and more states uh, completely change over the requirements uh, as well, right? And I think it's important for us to, to figure out good alternative pathways to ensure students are comfortable and competent and, and efficient, you know, arguably without ever touching a patient, which in itself is very different from, from even my lifetime of learning. So those are great points. I mean, I think that that brings up some realities of clinical time. Um, we can't, as educators, we, we really cannot standardize it. I mean, we, we joke about, you know, the clouds and the magnets that students can be. Um, and, and we certainly do have control and standard ability to standardize our, our simulation um, time with the students. Um, so two questions that have come in that I think kind of go together and kind of uh, further this, this dialogue right now. Um, one is, you know, intubation. I think that's a really good example that we can all wrap our heads around and one that we all feel is critical and, and it's kind of a legacy challenge for primary education programs. Is that a skill that we just need to kind of concede we have to wait until we're back together in small lab groups? Um, or is there a reality that we can actually test and practice and demonstrate competency using virtual based um, education or platforms for a skill such as intubation. And the second question that kind of feeds into that, um, and this kind of goes to your point, Kim, is if we're not getting access to live patients, is now a time to start to explore cadavers? Interesting thought about cadavers that, um, that that thought hadn't occurred to me. It's a great, depending upon the type of cadaver, it could be a great simulation tool, but there's expense to that. I think, you know, the, the bottom line is, I think the answer is going to be different for everyone. You know, if you have um, 30 students, as we do, it's different than if you have six students or, uh, you know, 100 students like UCLA does, how you're going to answer it. And I think that there are some, um, uh, 3D printing options that have been used also to simulate some airway things that that might be the answer. Uh, we're sort of I feel like we're just sort of on the on the edge of things that you know through through crisis comes growth and I think that people are going to find ways to do things that we're all going to learn from going forward. Um, you know, somebody said 
yesterday, gosh, you know, imagine if this had happened 20 years earlier, we'd be at a dead stop. I feel like if it happens 10 years from now, it'll be a whole different ball game. Yeah, I, so, agree. I agree with Kim, Bill. Um, the, uh, it, the, the answer will be different. Uh, there's budgets, there's uh, the availability of equipment. Certainly, it can be done. Um, it's at what limit and, and to, to what's available to you out there. There is, uh, I know Mar will probably speak on some more AR things. Uh, I do want to say that if we truly are going to go down the route where we do use some sort of simulation um, for these critical skills, is that um, I kind of, you know, I got I to tout the, the um, SSH just a little bit that the simulationists that are providing the fidelity behind these and the structure and format of that encounter, we, they need to have a foundational background or education of somewhat in sim. Uh, um, and I'm sure there's gonna be requirements that they're either credentialed or there's an accredited uh, simulation program in order for us to make that substitution. So the criteria behind that will be interesting to follow out uh, in the long run as well. Go ahead, Amar. Sorry, there are some significant challenges <laughs> with cadavers, right? To, I think uh, to that point, um, obviously, access and cost, as Kim mentioned, uh, keeping in mind pathogens plays a pivotal role in this, right? I mean, we certainly, uh, you know, you're seeing, uh, you know, slightly grim topic, but we're seeing funerals come to a pause. It's just the same. Um, and so access to cadavers, I actually think it's going to get a bit more challenging. And it's primarily because as we think about complex disease processes and still transmissions of those diseases, um, it, you know, you're certainly going to see challenges in, in how cadavers are, are available or, or, or leveraged. And, you know, thinking through in a larger term, there's also, you know, obviously re uh, religious and other challenges that exist with access to that'll start to play a pivotal role in, in how we do that training. Certainly, and, and we are getting some comments um, about some of the ethical aspects of, of cadaver um, utilization and education, and I think that's a general concern that's that's true across all disciplines of medicine. So, um, so thank you um, for for going down that path a little bit and bringing that up. Um, we are at 61 minutes, but there is still 114 attendees connected. 113, sorry to whoever we just lost. Um, our, our panelists agreed to do about another 10 minutes um, with regards to their schedules, and thank you for that. So um, if there's any last minute questions, um, please get those typed in real quick. Um, and then I'll kind of just open it up for the panelists to kind of give any summarizing thoughts um, or things that you know they, they, they want to share. Um, as we prepare to make that transition, I do want to uh, thank um, the Society for Simulation and Healthcare um, for one, collaborating on this. I think we really established a, a powerhouse of, of speakers today and uh, the attendance and the interaction speaks very well to that. Um, SSH, SSIH is also providing um, one hour of CEU um, if you registered um, or you can always follow up um, to the Society for Simulation and Healthcare. Um, just be aware um, it is not CAPSI um, CE, but it is CE that is applied to other health professions, um, and always check with your state. It may help you with your educator um, credentials or license, whatever verbiage your state uses. So um, thank you to uh, SSIH for collaborating and for also uh, providing that one hour CEU to our attendees. So follow up with them if, if uh, that is of interest. So, um, you know, again, kind of getting these questions about what can we be doing now um, to scaffold into when we do get back to live labs, um, what sort of modifications do you guys, um, I'm sorry, I'm from the Midwest, guys is a collective colloquial term, um, foresee kind of being challenging um, or best practices moving forward. And then if you have any final comments um please share those so we'll we'll go through the same order of with the pre-submitted questions uh andrew if you want to start to wrap us up well, i think the it, it goes back to again there's there's a highly flexible situation where i think one of those educators are adept at compared to almost any other group is flexibility because EMS by its very nature requires that. 
uh, how many people have, you know, wait, you, you, you put your mannequins out in the mud? What, what are you thinking? Well, that's where we see our patients. So even hearing Kim saying that she had access to at least get, a, you know, students in a little bit, well, it's like I was thinking, thinking about her uh, training center there, and it's like, well, you know what? You could put a bunch of, of airway heads or IV start or mannequins or any number of stations outside of the facility there, keep the social distancing. The instructors could still even video distance uh, video with their iPhone from a distance uh, and just have the, the decontamination disinfect, uh, disinfecting between, and they could still do a great deal of infra of, of skills testing and practice and things like that without ever being inside the building and and worrying about things like that so each one of you is going to have some flexibility based on your existing rules and situation in your state and or locale and it's how to get creative and, and address those things um, again very simple on up to very complex and just keep things moving forward and and you've got such a great network of people through nemsi uh, obviously, uh, SSH, we, we, we just want to help everybody keep going forward, no matter which organization, which people you talk to. So reach out and ask for ideas and help, and we'll all pitch in and, and help you keep going forward. Has SSH um, provided any resources that are accessible for our uh, attendees? We have an entire web page of items. If you go to ssih.org, uh, there's a COVID-19 page and there's all kinds of resources. There's a literature on how virtual simulation works, recognizing that's not a one-for-one -one research, uh, but the concepts clearly are there for the remote and distance simulation. All kinds of links to resources that people are providing for free, for, for free through our corporate roundtable and others. Uh, video-based resources, whatever it may be that they're offering, just loads and loads of stuff there. And and I know there's others that have that as well. NEMC has been doing that, the International Nursing Association on Clinical Simulation and Learning, the Associ Association for Standardized Patient Educators, uh, if you're looking at SP-specific stuff and how you can use those for uh, honing interview skills over the distance. It doesn't even have to be an OSCE where you're actually doing the summative evaluation. It's just engaging people and and how to how to manage things over a distance so loads and loads of things that are out there and again if you have any questions just ask and we'll help you find them as best we can thank you for that and again thank you for uh, working with me to get this webinar um, scheduled tim any uh departing thoughts and um, best practice suggestions uh, no, we just, I, we, kind of echo. oh go oh. ahead tim <laughs> kim and tim i knew that we'd get it sooner or later through this um, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I kind of echo uh, Andrew's uh, comments that there certainly is going to be some challenges and we got to kind of look outside of it. I mean, I've even seen an organization that they did the outside thing and they actually made it part of the competency of how to clean the equipment before the next person came. So they got uh, the practitioner got a little bit of, uh, you know, here's how you disinfect things, uh, practice at the same time. It was just creativity. That, that's what it is. And resources. I can't speak enough like Andrew that there's a ton of resources out there, SSH's website, NAMSI's website, you name it. Uh, if you start going and, and digging around, there's a lot out there. Even with SSH, there's, an, there's affinity groups that doesn't require you to be a member. Uh, a lot of information going back and forth. And, and the sky's the limit. Yeah, we're actually being pushed. It's going to test us as educators. Um, but I think every time we shine on things like that, because we've always been able to create a, be creative and pivot well. So, and uh, as time moves on, uh, we'll see, uh, there may be a new norm that we're gonna find out that, you know what, really we might not need traditional things like what we've been doing. And we can just stick with this because we found it to be very effective. That's kind of uh, my closing uh, thoughts. Thank you for those. Kim? Yeah, I think, you know, we have tried to front load as much as we can in, that doesn't need to be hands on. And then when we bring students in, then our primary objective is going to be safe practice with the highest value activities that we can. So cohorting students in small groups, exposure to a small number of instructors, masking, cleaning, screening, all of those things. And I really agree with Tim. I think that some of the practices that we have adopted throughout this learning process it are, are things that we're gonna take forward, that we're gonna be able to be much more nimble in the future and uh, probably better at what we do. 
Thank you for that. And um, I, you know, I think there's certainly a lot of value in students learning how to disinfect as well. I mean, sometimes you see in hospital simulations, uh, they'll simulate an infectious patient and then someone will come to clean up and it's totally not close to how you would clean up after an infectious patient encounter. So um, the transference of experiences right now can be considered to be uh, quite broad. I, I agree with, with both of you on that. So awesome. Uh, Dr. Amar Patel, if you could uh, close this out. Sure. So I think uh, there's a lot of great points that were made throughout, the, uh, throughout right? And I think the, your sky's the limit. Don't let your imagination, uh, the, don't let the limitations of your own imagination drive that forward. People are doing some really, really unique things out there. I would encourage anybody and everybody to go out, go about, look around, see what people are doing and take those best practices. There's no point in, in reinventing that. Um, there's been some great dialogue and I'm gonna highlight uh, some of the work SSH is doing. Um, there's a COVID-19 entire chat that's, uh, that's posted. Um, take a look at that. There are some great suggestions of, of work people are working through, especially in this, in this environment, um, you know, and but beg, borrow, um, and pillage as much as you can, because that's the only way as a, as a whole group, we're all gonna advance the technology. And as I mentioned early on, uh, who would have thought a pandemic would have tried to drive the digital age, and it certainly has done that for us. So, but you know, we encourage you and employ you to share what you're doing, because that's the only way as a community that we're gonna expand the work that we're doing for each other. That's a great sentiment to how this experience really is pushing us to reinvent, rethink, and uh, think outside of the box. Um, even we've seen that swing and that pendulum swing with that uh, simulation is, you know, it's not war story recreating now. It's, you know, how do we be creative? How do we tr uh, tap into our creative side to create a standardized, replicable, um, educational experience of, of real value? So um, in some ways, when you reflect on that, we're just kind of accelerating that right now. Um, well, and if uh, folks are interested, I think one other point I'll make is um, we, uh, you know, CA launched a whole podcast stream, and if you're interested, there's one that I, I'll highlight specifically is uh, we did a huge talk with Microsoft uh, that came out last week, um, and I encourage you to take a look at it. It's literally talking about augmented and virtual reality and the reshaping of how clinical education um, is really going to change, right? But it's you know from the viewpoint of, of both of two industry partners, so it's super interesting. Um, but uh, definitely one if you're interested in the augmented and virtual side, take a listen. So to those that have submitted uh, questions that we did not get to, I apologize. Um, to those that submitted comments asking for the panelists' emails, uh, the referencing and apps and things that they have talked about, um, as soon as we are done with this call, um, I will send them an email and ask them to please share that and we will work through the NEMZ office to distribute that. Um, either through a follow-up email or through one of our information hubs. Um, I think those are uh, great requests that are easily achievable. So um, again, I want to thank our panelists for uh, really, you're the ones that afforded us this opportunity and time um, to talk about um, some topics that we're all passionate about. Again, I want to thank our panelists for taking the time to be with us today. Um, I know that all of you are in significant leadership positions and have demanding schedules given the circumstances we're all facing. And again, thank you to uh, the Society of Simulation and Healthcare for collaborating, partnering, and providing those CEs. And of course, thank you to the office at NAEMSE uh, for always being so supportive of the endeavors of the board and more importantly, um, our professional membership and our EMS educators. Uh, thank you, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, see you at the next conference that's TBD, it seems like. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye.